If you're doing woodworking, and I don't care if it's hand tool or power tool, you need to cut mortises. You know, those rectangular holes the tenons go into? They are an essential part of furniture making. And of course, there are machines that cut these things, but they are big and kind of expensive. When most of us need to cut a mortise, we do this. We grab a standard bevel-edged chisel, lay it between our gauge lines, and chop that thing out. And there is nothing wrong with this approach. Unless it's not working for you. Then maybe you want to try something different. And I am not here to tell you how to cut the joinery for your projects. But I do have a couple of suggestions. If you're struggling to cut a good mortise using a standard bench chisel, well, the problem might not be you. I usually tell people to practice, but this is one case where you just might need a different approach. So this is what I've been doing for years. I grab a bevel-edged chisel and a fancy adjustable pin mortise gauge. I set the pins to the corner of my chisel and lock it down. Then I gauge my lines on my stock, knife the lines nice and deep, and get to work chopping. I chop with my chisel straight up and down and the bevel facing the direction I'm traveling. At the end, I flip my chisel, get it right in my knife line, and chop to define the end. Then I use a narrower chisel to clear the waste, and I come back for another pass, this time with the chisel held at an angle so the bevel is plumb, and I work in the opposite direction to get down to depth. Simple. Unless it's not. I mean, you might not know how hard you can hit a chisel like this. It might twist in the cut. You might get crooked mortises. You might just be getting bad results. And maybe what we need to do is just start over with some new equipment. For instance, I recommend you buy a dedicated mortise chisel. And I know what you're thinking, oh god, I have to get a whole nother set of chisels. No, you don't. It's okay. Most historical woodworkers owned one, and it was usually five sixteenths of an inch wide. And that sounds like a very weird size for a chisel, but it actually makes sense. You generally want your tenons to be about one third of the thickness of your stock. So if you have a five sixteenth chisel, which conveniently is exactly eight millimeters, then it's about a third of three quarter inch stock, kind of a fat third. And if you're using one inch stock, well then five sixteenths is kind of a skinny third. It really works perfectly for both three-quarter inch and one inch stock, and those are the two most common sizes for furniture components. So if you have this one chisel, you're going to be all set for 99% of your projects. Now, you're probably also thinking that you need one of these fancy adjustable mortise gauges with a bunch of different pins and all the stuff, and the good news is you don't need one of these at all. Just grab any old marking gauge and add a second pin. This is a gauge I made last year, and I just glued in a finishing nail, about 5 sixteenths away from the original pin. Nails are good for this style of gauge because they're flexible. Bend the tips until they're close to your chisel, and then file them until they're dead on. Notice that I'm angling my file up, and working from both sides of each pin. You don't want a little point at the tip. That would just scratch the wood. Look at this old shop-made gauge. Notice how the pin has a definite curve from front to back. The maker filed this pin into a blade shape so that it slices through the fibers as you push the gauge across the work. Your pins should be knife sharp, equal in height, and curved front to back. As you work, bring the chisel in and check the corners against the tips of your pins. I adjusted mine four or five times while I was making this video, and now it's perfect. When you mark your mortise, Keep the fence firmly against your reference edge, and push the gauge as you slowly roll it forward into the cut. Take three or four light passes. This keeps the grain from grabbing the cutters and pulling them off course. After a few light strokes, you should have clear marks that are easy to see. In some woods, you'll need to run a pencil into those lines to make them more visible. I'll do that throughout this video. Now, Everybody thinks that mortise chisels are so heavy and stout so they can take a beating. And that's true, but that's only part of it. I mean, I did just cut a mortise using a thin bevel edge bench chisel. These mortise chisels are heavy duty so that you can hit them and pry up chips, but that's only part of it. These broad, flat sides, they're just as important. A standard bench chisel has beveled edges. This is a handy feature for paring into tight spaces, but it means that the sides of the chisel have basically no surface area. When you drive the chisel into the wood, there's nothing to keep it straight besides your skill and control. The rest of the chisels on screen are for chopping, 
and any chisel with wide, square sides used to be called a registered chisel. As you drive the chisel into the mortise, those flat surfaces register against the sides of the joint and keep the chisel straight. When you're trying to chop a mortise that's straight and square, that registration can be a huge help. Of course, a wide chisel also has to have a very big bevel, and that has some consequences for the way we work. Let's drive our mortise chisel straight down into this piece of cherry. The first hit penetrates deeply, but almost immediately, the chisel slows down. I'm hitting it harder with each mallet blow, but the chisel barely moves. The tool is heavy enough, and it's razor sharp, so why can't I keep driving it down? If we zoom in, we can see the problem. The wood underneath the bevel is becoming compressed under that downward pressure. There's nowhere for the wood to go, so it pushes up against the bevel, and our chisel stops moving. And there's another problem. Let's say I want to define the end of my mortise. My chisel is sharp, and I can feel it dropping right into my knife line. This should be a crisp edge, but when I strike the chisel, it moves back behind my knife line. It's not a small thing, either. My chisel is about a sixteenth of an inch outside of where it's supposed to be. If there's wood underneath the bevel, that upward pressure will always force the chisel backwards, away from the bevel. It can never travel straight down. To make this big chisel work, we're going to need a complete technique. First thing, you might not want to chop in your vise. Even a good one might let the work slip under forceful mallet hits. A good, low-tech alternative is to clamp a board in your vise and then clamp your work to the board. If you keep your work flat on your bench top, it can't go anywhere when you hit it. Here's one method for chopping. Start your chisel a good half inch away from your knife line. Have the bevel facing toward you and angle the chisel so the bevel is plumb. Give it a tap, then walk it back an eighth of an inch and hit it again. And again. Flip your chisel, bring it back to the beginning, and give it a good smack. Now lever out your waist. You've just created an open space. We call that clearance and it gives the chisel some place to go when you hit it. With clearance in my mortise, I can move confidently along the joint, taking big bites and hitting the chisel pretty hard. I've got nothing but waste behind my chisel, so I can lever back away from myself to clear out the chips. I'm far away from my knife lines, and I can't hurt anything. As I get to the end, I leave a big chunk of waste inside my knife line. This protects the edges of my joint, which are the parts you're most likely to see in the finished product. To get down to my full depth, I can take another pass. I've left waste inside my knife lines, so levering out the chips is no problem, and the work goes quickly. When you're nearly done, you can use the flat back of the chisel to scoop out waste more effectively. Now, to finish off those ends, stand your chisel up so the back is plumb and chop. Then walk back half the distance to your line and chop again half the distance again. When you're down to something less than a sixteenth of an inch, you can drop your chisel right into that knife line and chop down. There's almost no wood against the bevel, and your chisel can go down perfectly straight without moving the knife line at all. Go ahead and repeat that at the other end, and your mortise should be done. Through the magic of editing, that looked easy, but it's not. It takes practice, and you need to set up your work to make things as easy and repeatable as possible. For instance, one of the big problems when you're chopping is keeping your chisel plumb side to side, keeping it straight up and down. Here's an easy trick for that. I like to set up my work parallel to the edge of my bench. When I'm angling my chisel to get ready for a hit, I just keep the chisel in line with the edge of the work and the edge of the bench, and it's much more likely to stay straight. A little visual reference might be all you need to stay on track. Of course, we do need a tenon to go into that mortise, and tenons could be a whole other video. But here are a few tips. I lay out my tenon with the same gauge. The pins can't move, so the tenon will be the correct thickness. The number one rule for sawing out your tenon is don't saw anything you can't see. I like to kind of nibble my way across the end. When I have a nice, long kerf, then I drop my hand and work down to my baseline. Keeping the piece at a 45 degree angle helps a lot because I can work across the top and side lines at the same time. Once I'm down to my baseline, I flip the piece and cut the lines I can see on the other side. Now, bring your piece plumb and saw straight down to clear out any remaining waste in the kerf. There's lots of ways to do the shoulders, but I like to cut them on my shooting board for easy holding and added accuracy. The completed tenon will need a little trimming with a chisel, but it drops nicely into my mortise with good contact in the joint and a clean line where the two pieces meet. 
Now, I'd never want to give you the impression that there's only one way to chop a mortise. So here's another technique. Instead of starting at either end, you can begin in the middle. Keep the bevel plumb and give it a tap. Then flip it around and chop in from the other direction. Flick out your waist and you've already made your clearance. Now you can progress in both directions, deepening the mortise in that V-shape while getting down to depth and staying away from your ends. I'm chopping this one behind a piece of plexiglass to give you a sense for what happens inside the joint as the chisel drives into the wood and breaks up the waste. Inevitably, someone is going to ask me what I think about drilling out mortises. The short answer is, I think you shouldn't do it unless you have an unusual situation. Adding a drill just adds another tool and more complexity to the process. I've done it a lot, and I don't find it one bit faster. If you control your first few chops to create clearance, then you've accomplished the same thing anyway. Of course, if you really like drilling out some of the waste, don't let me stop you. It's your work. And this video is not meant to be the last word in mortise technique. I actually decided to make this video because I wasn't really happy with the way I was cutting the joint. The results just weren't as reliable and predictable as I wanted them to be. So I started researching other techniques so I could take out some of the variables and make things more predictable. I recommend you do the same thing. You don't have to take my word for any of this stuff. Go look at other experienced woodworkers and see how they approach this joint. Paul Sellers really champions the bench chisel approach, and he makes a good argument. You don't need any specialized chisels, just the ones you've already got. His approach stresses sensitivity, so you don't bend the chisel. Now, this technique with a heavy mortise chisel and the bevel facing me comes from Joshua Klein's excellent book on hand tool joinery. I like his technique the best, and I'll link to his book down in the description. The V technique, where you chop in from both sides, comes from Peter Follinsby. He's probably our foremost expert on 17th century joinery, and he makes reproductions of some of the earliest American furniture. Peter has a couple of books, but he also has a YouTube channel. It's pretty new, and he doesn't have nearly the subscribers he deserves. So let's fix that. Go over to Peter's channel and subscribe to him. His videos are great, and there's a lot to learn from his approach. In the future, I'm probably going to make more videos on mortise technique. This one is more like a starting place if you want to improve your own work. Over the last couple of weeks while I've been researching this video, my mortise technique has improved a lot. I think because I focused on just having a single mortise chisel, a single fixed gauge, and an easy, predictable approach. Taking out the variables really seems to help make the work come out better every time. Now, this isn't the last word in mortising, but it is enough mortise technique for you to practice and get ready for some great upcoming furniture builds that I'm going to have in the next couple of weeks. If you'd like to see those builds early, you might want to become a patron. Patrons get early access to all of my videos. They also get exclusive content and access to the best woodwork discussion forum on the internet. If you'd like to be one of the people who make these videos possible, go on over to patreon.com slash rexkruger and check out all the rewards I have from my patrons. They are the heart of this channel. And my viewers are also obviously the heart of this channel, and I'm really glad to have them. Thanks so much for watching.